Hi, so we've got an um, interesting item for Teardown today. Um, apologies to the person that sent this in um, quite a while ago. I can't find any of the paperwork you sent, so uh, I'm um, afraid I uh, can't credit you, but please feel free to leave your name in the comments. Um, what this is, it's a wearable insulin pump for type 1 diabetics. It's called the Omnipod. It comes in this uh, sterile sealed pack. Basically, the idea is that um, you fill it with insulin using this syringe and needle provided you then stick it on an arm or another sort of convenient body part and it communicates with a little wireless pocket device which provides sort of control but also does blood sugar monitoring so that you can do a blood sugar test with this little box and it will then communicate to this thing to tell it how much insulin to give i'm not totally sure if it sort of continuously communicates for each dose or whether it just gives a gives a dose rate to this and then up, up, updates it as and when so the, yeah, this is an alternative to sort of manual injections and also the larger sort of tube-based insulin pump. So the idea is this this um, lasts for about three days. So basically, you can you know, stick one of these on, and then that that's provides enough insulin insulin for up to um, three days use, and then this is just disposed of. It's a, a disposable item. And uh, from what I can find, the price looks around the sort of twenty twenty-five dollar sort of mark. Obviously, there's various sort of insurance things and so on that distort the actual cost. Now, fortunately, I've got two of these, so there's one that I've already um, taken apart to try and get, get some idea of how it works. We've just got this uh, the base unit that provides sort of the mounting that the uh, sticky this sort of sticky stuff is uh, attached to. Then there's like a plastic chassis, and the battery seems to have gone uh, gone walk about. But there's three batteries. These look like um, alkaline button cells. They've got yeah, these got A76 written on them and made in USA. So um, these are not like the um, silver oxide ones we saw in the um, pill cameras. These look like fairly standard alkaline batteries, which you can, you get a pretty decent amount of current out of. PCB it uses the, these little springs to contact the batteries. These just sit in place. They're not, not actually fixed. This is all obviously assembled in some sort of jig. So the PCB sits on top of here. And this is actually held in by the sort of, um, plastic post, which are heat staked over to uh, fix this down. And all the other connections are made by various spring contacts. So you can see there's these little spring um, leaf spring contacts here. There's also some of these little um, coil springs that go through to other parts of the mechanism. So, for example, here there's a what looks like a sort of very simple encoder as this, as this rotates the, these um, metal parts on the shaft make contact with a sort of spring there and there and again these just spring down onto uh, the various gold plated pads on the PCB so it's obviously a very simple interconnect system not much on this I'm pretty sure this is a custom part um, well, it's it's got a part sort of semi-recognisable part number SC9 in SO8, which is a family of um, Freescale now and XP microcontrollers. The uh, suffix isn't recognised. I can't find any record of it. And um, this has clearly got a, um, a radio in it. There's you can see there's um, an antenna that goes. It sort of where is it? So there's an antenna that sort of starts around there, goes pretty much all the way around the outside of the board and ends up here. So judging by the length of that antenna, I'm guessing we're in the sort of UHF, VHF range, or sort of probably somewhere between sort of 500 and maybe 900 megahertz, perhaps it's 915. I don't know if there's any dedicated band for this sort of stuff or if they're using uh, one of the normal unlicensed bands, but there's clearly the transceiver for that in this chip. But I can't find any of, the, of this product range listed on the NXP website that includes an on-chip radio. I think there may also be a, a power driver in there, which we'll get to in a minute when, when we look at the um, how the motor works. But other than that, there's you know, clearly really nothing nothing on here. Um, the, basically, the, the procedure for starting this up is the first thing you do is you um, inject the insulin into the, into the tank and this activates it. You then do like a pairing operation that, that tells the, um, the handheld unit, you know, to connect to this unit. I would, I would hope it does something like send like a one-time key for um, security because obviously this could be, if the security in this hasn't been done properly, that could be quite a serious uh, matter of people walking around with these pumps that people can then suddenly um, be given the wrong doses by someone uh, acting maliciously then that would be uh, rather bad so I would hope these have got um, security against sort of being actuated by anything other than the original um, handheld that it was paired with and also alarms if it goes out of, goes out of um, contacts and so on. There is a little beep you can see on this one you can see there's a sort of piezo disc here 
that sits sort of up here and there's, there's again there's um, a couple of these spring contacts which will make contact with um, the parts of the uh, the piezo disc to give you some beepiness so as well as the batteries on this side we can see this is the actual tank that holds the insulin um, I'm guessing this is some sort of piston type arrangement again we we'll have to uh, figure out exactly what's going on there and it's got this shaft that goes all the way through it and so we've got that um, encoder arrangement at the end this is the cannula that actually gets injected basically what happens is after it's been paired you, after you filled it with insulin it then goes through a sequence where it purges the air and then um, it instructs you to sort of stick it on and then you, you then give an instruction this cannula then um, stabs out you know as she sort of stabs into the body to um, provide the uh, the path for the um, insulin then it obviously pumps the insulin in at whatever rate it uh, deems necessary so the, uh, the this injection part you see there's uh, what looks like actually quite a hefty spring in here that pushes this sort of this way this slides along these sort of copper colored um, rods and what initiates that is there's a cam down here which is holding basically holding this back a bit difficult to see here so say so we've got um, a cam here which rotates around this axis rather difficult to uh, so that's sort of holding it back there so what happens is this sort of rotates to one side and the end of that is here and this rides on this cam and if you look on the other side there's a, a flat section here so when it hits that flat section um, that cam comes this way towards the camera rotates this around that way and then this pit gets out of the way and the needle flies out in the um uh, under the strength of that that's that spring and i think this piece here what this is doing is, is once it's moved forward i think this provides like a ratchet to prevent it moving back again just to make sure it goes out and stays out try not to stab myself and uh, see how it actually works now the actual motor provides the motor drive this is really interesting this is what i assume is muscle wire you can see it starts here, goes around this pulley, across to this point here where it's fixed, then goes around another pulley, then off to this other electrode. So we've got these two connections here. But we've also got a centre connection. So I think what happens is each of these sections of muscle wire are actuated alternately. So what that does, this moves this side to side and we've got these two ratchets on these um, two gear wheels here. So I think what, what happens is this moves from side to side and each time it moves it clicks one ratchet round like that and I've actually just triggered the um, cannula. Good job I was holding it that way around. I didn't realize the camera got quite that far so we can see now this is this is sort of shot forward. It's now being retained by this And so this is now in its sort of ready to pump mode. But say so each time this this moves side to side, it just clicks. Probably just about hear that clicking. And you can see it's rotating the um, those wheels. And also at the end we've got this looks like this makes contact with either of these two contacts here so it knows when it's hit, hit each end so obviously it actuates the muscle wire until it sees that contact being made then it turns it off and then it actuates it the other way around or obviously it probably just maybe just does it one at a time if it's pumping a small amount each each stroke of that probably represents a certain amount of the uh, insulin so it's just trying to actually actuate that and see what happens Instead of looking at how this is wired on the um, PCB, it looks like they're using two batteries in series to provide a three volt supply. Then this third battery looks like it goes to, to pins very close to where the, the motor's connected. The, um, those are these, the, the, those two contacts where these, the, the, these contact. And this, all this goes 
back down to this corner of this chip and the positive of this battery also goes to that area. So I suspect that that's just some additional voltage to provide the supply for the, um, the muscle wire motor. And I, I suspect um, each of these connections goes to two pins on the, um, on the chip. It could just be that they're just using two IOs to get strength, get additional strength, but because that extra positive also goes there, I, I expect they've probably got something like an H-Bridge driver on there, so I, I'm guessing this is probably a, a fairly customised variant. It's maybe got their uh, SO8 core, but some cuts, a bit of cut, yeah, the radio and the um, output driver are probably custom. Obviously, as a disposable item, this is a fairly high volume thing, so it makes sense to um, customise the micro to have exactly the right peripherals to avoid any the need for external components. You can see there's very little ex in, some, in the way of external components. You've got the, um, the crystal and just a few passives and that, that's pretty much it. Okay, so if I uh, apply about three and a half volts to this muscle wire, you can see it flips those uh, ratchets alternately and turns the uh, that central shaft so it's pulling about 250 milliamps obviously that chip might have some current limiting in there as well so i don't know how much current this would normally uh, put into this thing but sort of very neat system for producing you know a relatively high torque low speed motion with sort of you know no motor just a piece about yeah basically a piece of wire it's a very uh, elegant little solution I think. Now one thing I haven't yet figured out is how this detects when you um, you fill it. So I might have to use the other one. I don't, don't know if there's enough left on this but um, so I'll just put some coloured fluid in there just so we can see where it's going. And this just goes in the... Uh, it's interesting that it's coming out of the cannula but that, that cannula might actually normally be sealed in normal operation. I don't really see, I was ex you know, expecting to see this filling up. Quite sure we seem to have got a piece of metal or something in there, so uh, it could be that we've sort of broken, I've broken something in the process of, um, so I think what it is, I'll, t I'll pull the rest of this apart and then I'll try filling that other unit I've got, um, see what happens. So I'll just take this uh, apart just to get an idea of how the uh, pumping actually works. I, it also may well be because the cannula is fired, it may, that may well have opened up a valve, there could well be some sort of valve arrangement that seals it when it's in its sort of non-actuated position, but I think if we pull the rest of this apart that might give some more clues as to uh, what's going on. Okay, so this uh, is quite a clever little detail for the way the cannula is sealed into the um, unit. It's just got this sort of slightly sort of squishy, probably silicone or something, sort of squishy ball that just sort of snaps into uh, snaps into the hole, which is uh, quite a nice little detail. All right, okay, I think we can see what's going on here. Um, there is a screw thread on the inside of this, so. I think what happens is that when you fill it, this spring isn't acting as a universal joint. I think it's actually more like a ratchet. In that, when you fill it, I think that will probably, yeah. So if that, if that sort of biased that way, it does allow. I think this, yeah, this does get pushed in. So this actually goes in inside here. And then as this rotates, yeah, so uh, this then rotates, undoes the screw and then pushes the piston back, back out. So that's, yes, yeah, so it's like a sort of friction coupling. So it allows the, the initial fill, it allows it to push hard I think this might be sort of pre-biased or something that, that's so that spring releases I think maybe perhaps this spring is in its initial state is actually slightly un perhaps they're using the this end of the spring I wonder if it maybe even rests on the cannula or something so that this is sort of free to slide when it's being filled 
and then once it starts rotating the spring then grips so instead of being able to slide the spring then grips the shaft and then allows the rotation of this thing to then push undo this screw and then push the um, piston backwards so I think I'll have to um, take the other one apart a little bit more carefully and see if we can actually observe all that um, happening but I think yeah that's some, some very clever mechanical details in this thing it's really neat so we just put this back in the and this I think is just a guide this this extra thing here is just a guide to keep it straight so it doesn't uh, go off course and also I suspect because the one thing I couldn't figure out was how it detected the fact that it's being filled so I'm guessing if that's moving out that's probably just going to hit a contact somewhere in fact yeah there's I think there were probably two springs going through these two holes here so as this thing gets filled this rod moves out and then probably shorts across these two springs here to tell it that this this has now been filled and ready to uh, activate and I would imagine they probably also detect that it's empty by th this um, this encoder detail at the end obviously once this is at the end of the travel this probably is going to stop turning so again it's going to detect the fact that it's stopped turning so it doesn't actually need to know how much insulin is in here all it has to know is that it's you know it, it's all done and finished because it will then this will then stop stop turning because the pistons hit the bottom of its travel so that it, that it will then see that this encoder isn't changing and that will then tell you that it's run out and obviously it will give a, an audible alert so um, yeah that's, uh, so this is just uh, like a, again a sort of slightly soft silico material acting as a piston in here Don't th I suspect there's probably aren't any valves the um, my guess is the again the filling part is like, like a soft silicone thing so I'm getting that pretty self seals where you, you, know, you inject it and then when you take the needle out it then, then seals up again and again I, I think there's probably going to be a detail that seals the cannula in fact there's, yeah, there, there might actually be um, it could be the shape of the silicone also makes it makes the fill, fill port act as a one way valve and say so the cannula may well be sealed by some you know, part, part of the action of this um, injector yes yeah, so and this this um, spring has got a serious amount of force on that so I'm just holding this cam down manually and that in turn seems to be holding this copper strip down retaining this so if I release that cam bang and so that's and that's got to be a good pound or so of force on that so it's really it's not messing about it really is you know, yeah in fact yes yeah, so, so so what's actually happening with this side strip here is it's being latched by this this little flap here yeah so that th this will basically slams it slams this forward it gets latched by here so that doesn't go here and then this just just back flips back again so you just get a very fast motion I'm not sure if that actually is copper or it's copper plated maybe it's uh, something just for its sort of springiness but the, um, the sort of I think it's sort of a complete frame to actually yeah, the um, the spring is actually mounted to that so that's providing this the actual mechanical strength so this this whole thing's on like it's like a little subframe so that it doesn't uh, bend the plastic and uh, distort that because there's sort of quite a lot of force <laughs> yeah, I'm still intrigued why this is sort of apparently copper I suppose it might be something like beryllium copper or something to sort of provide the right amount of springiness but so this is that's the clip that retains the um, this piece against the spring pressure and then the cam just pushes this down and then that lets that fly forward but that's a uh, quite surprisingly powerful spring and all these other parts are heat staked in so they've probably got a sort of pretty automated manufacturing process that sort of probably puts all these little springs contact springs in okay i've just peeled some of the casing off this uh, this uh, second one i don't want to take it fully apart because i want the um the sounder to stay connected so you can see if it beeps when it turns on so we can see the um the piezo sounder being located in a um just sort of circle indent in that top case we can also see the position of these two springs here 
where so that that rod there comes out and shorts those two when it gets filled Actually, I think that, that piece of metal that we saw coming out of the um, thing last time, I think that might actually be a one-way valve. Struggling to actually get anything into this at the moment. There we go. Don't see that um, the shaft now coming out. It's about to short these two uh, contacts. And we've got some beeps. So that's now woken up, obviously, because that's a contact closure. This this thing can sit in a very, very low power state. Just a bit more in. Just waiting for the activation. It's not having to do any radio comms or anything before this point. So, you know, this thing can have a good shelf life because it shouldn't be drawing any power from the batteries, really. It's uh, sort of filled. Okay, so here's that how this um, spring grip detail works. Basically, you can just see the edge of the spring there, and the end of the spring is being retained by this spring clip here, which is. You can see here in its um, release state, so the end of the spring is there and its unsprung position is over here, so it's about half a turn when it's open. So in this condition, the spring is being held open, which allows the piston to move up and down freely as the um, insulin is injected in. But what then, then happens is, as soon as this starts turning, this starts turning this way, and this clip, is going to disappear down that hole in this um, in this end plate. So as soon as this goes into that hole, this is going to go this way, and then this spring is going to release in this direction. So the spring is now gripping the piston, and then further rotation of this will actually rotate will rotate this outer sleeve that can then push the um, push the piston back by the motor so it's uh, another very clever little mechanical detail here yeah. okay so here you can see this is how the PCB is fixed these are just um, these heat stake posts there to uh, fix it Right, I think I'm going to take the PCB off and then just activate this motor and take it through its uh, start-up sequence. I just noticed an interesting little detail on this PCB. This corner, this little tab of PCB with a track running into it and some holes. So it's obvious that this is designed to sort of snap off in certain circumstances, we'll sort of take the uh, take the other one here. That just snapped away. Now that that looks like it's just connected to a pull-up resistor or something on the um, the micro. Now, the first thing I thought was that well, maybe there's a, a different version of this that's got um, perhaps like a, a pillar in here, so that when they put the PCB down, it snaps that off to give a different build build version. But actually, looking at it further. There's sort of quite a big hole in here, and if you look at the base, there's actually a sort of soft membrane here. So obviously, there is some provision for poking something in here to snap that off to make it. I mean, well, I mean, what what is it for? Um, this looks like it's resealable, so it's maybe to put it to some special mode, or I suppose it could be to deactivate it after it goes out, you know, after it's been out of date, so they've got a quick way of disabling it. Okay, we've wired up the, uh, get some wires up to the, um, 
this motor so instantly if you've not heard of it before muscle wire is um, a type of shape memory alloy that's designed to um, contract when it's heated so if we just activate these alternately we can get this motor to turn now the first thing that should happen is we should see this spring release to then lock the, um, the plastic shaft onto the brass shaft so it can then turn the um, turn the shaft and push the piston down so what we should see is this so we get it into a, get some light on it we should see this little lever ping down to the left into that uh, hole so that's now released the spring so the shaft is now um, connected to the piston and so the next thing that happens is that this flat comes around to here and then that is the lever that that's this lever here which is going to turn around and allow this piece to drop down and then which allows the cannula to fire there we go and then further pumping will then just uh, the uh, piston to move down. To make this easier I've just hooked a couple of diodes up to this and then connects it up to my signal generator so if I just give it a bipolar waveform it will activate each of these wires in turn. Of course being thermal it doesn't care about polarity. So that's just ticking away there so let's see how fast we can actually uh, run this thing. Signal generator hasn't quite got enough juice. Well, I think it's also probably um, because it's thermal. The time time factor is probably important. So that's yes, yeah, struggling at one hertz. So it's just about working at uh, half a hertz. So you're actually getting some uh, stuff coming out as the piston's moving down slowly. There's about 40 threads on the working part of this piston, about 50 um, teeth on here. So that's about sort of 2,000 full ratchets, probably 4,000 half ratchets for the full um, cycle. So uh, if it's, if it um, empties the whole chamber within that three day period, that's roughly one click per minute. So oh, it's a really interesting little bit of tech. I mean, the electronics are the electronics are really sort of pretty uninteresting. Nothing at all um, surprising there. But uh, say the mechanics are just fascinating. The little uh, all those little details and just a really clever way of producing this sort of small amount of motion without you know very little noise, no motors, no magnets. Just a sort of really simple. Um, nice application of um, shape memory alloys.